Hey everyone, this is John Buck, back with another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. And in this video, I'm going to uh, talk about second order systems. And again, it sort of assumes you've seen the first order systems uh, videos, two videos, one on the background and one on examples before you watch this. But second order systems, because they have uh, two delays of second order in it, uh, they can have a little more complexity of behavior. And we'll see there, there are different types of behavior depending on the parameters that are a little more complicated even than we saw with first order systems where positive and negative values of the coefficient gave us different behaviors. Uh, but let's switch over to the whiteboard and see how that works out. So again, our topic in this video is second order systems. Uh, if I look at it, I can write a second order system would look like this. Again, remember it's the, because the largest delay in the system is two, that's what tells me it's a second order system. But I do have these two coefficients, a1 and a2, uh, that I need to, to think about in terms of how the system be, or determine the behavior of the system. We'll see in a minute. Uh, we can go through and solve for the, uh, the, four, the, the, the frequency response of this uh, the same way we've, we've done earlier. Uh, I'm not going to go through the steps here, uh, but you can, you can pause if you want and solve for h of e to the j omega, and then come back and check your answers. So I'll, I'll wait here for a second while you pause the video. All right, so if we do this, we know that we get the coefficients in the, the numerator are just the coefficients of the input, x of n, the denominator is the coefficients of the delayed uh, terms for y of n. So my frequency response would look like this. But the behavior in time and frequency depend on relative values of a1 and a2. And basically what it comes down to is when I factor this denominator, if I want to factor this into two first order terms, like I would if I was going to use partial fractions, uh, when I do that I need to, uh, or, or it depends on what kind of roots I get when I do the factoring. So there's sort of three cases that we're really mainly interested in two. The first case is if we get, uh, we get uh, two distinct real roots. Right, so when I do the factoring, I get, I can factor it into two real values that are not equal to each other. Uh, and this is sometimes called overdamped. And we'll see when we look at the time, behavior, be, time domain be, behavior why that is. Second one is if I get uh, a, a complex conjugate Right, with real coefficients, I can still get two roots that are complex conjugates of each other. And this is often called underdamped. There's another name for this, just so you know your uh, signals vocabulary, somebody uses that. And the third, fairly rare case, is I get two equal real roots. So I can write the denominator as the square of a first order system. This is often, the, the name for this is critically damped. We're not going to talk a lot about critically damped systems. We're going to focus most of our attention and energy on these first two uh, today. But it's good to know for completeness sake, these are the three types of things uh, that can show up. So let's see uh, how that works out. Uh, so the first case is uh, if uh, a1 squared is greater than 4a2, we get 2 unequal real roots. Right, so when I factor it, I can say that h of e to the j omega, just to sort of talk what that would look like, I'll call those roots d1 and d2. I'd have something that was 1 minus d1 e to the minus j omega. Nope. I'm separated it. I'm just factoring it. And 1 minus d2 e to the minus j omega. Right, so those are my two, d1 and d2 are my unequal real roots. I then go through partial fractions. I know you'll all be sad not to see me do that again, uh, but I'm going to deprive you of that pleasure and just jump and say, well, we don't, for what we're talking about today, I don't even care too much about the exact values, but I can say that when I was done with that, I would end up, my second order system would be a sum of two terms with some coefficients, a1 and a2 in the numerator, and so when I do the inverse Fourier transform to get h of n, again, good chance to pause the video, practice on your own, then come back and check against my answer. 
right, we'd get a1, this first term would give me a1 times d1 to the n u of n, and the second term would be a2 times d2 to the n u of n. Right, so that's the first case. And in that case, it's just, it's just the sum of, of the two things we've already seen uh, in the previous video for first order just added together. And so we know that d1, you know, the relative, how close d1 and d2 are to n will determine, or to 1, will determine which one dies off faster. And then if they're, whether they're positive or negative, whether I have a high pass or low pass, or maybe a bit of each. If one's positive and the other one's negative, I'll have peaks at both omega equals 0 and pi. So, it, so it's... Uh, keeping the high and low frequencies, but possibly removing the middle. And the values of D1 and D2 will determine how sharp those values are. So, so most of what goes on from here is, is similar to what we already saw with first order second systems, just with uh, two of them in parallel. Let's talk about the second case, because this is unique to second order systems, which is when we get the, the roots are complex conjugate. Right, so when, when this is happening, uh, and this happens right, from the quadratic formula, we find that if, if a1 squared is less than 4a2, uh, then in that case, it's, it's maybe better to think of we end up with something that's the polar form. We, it turns out we can say if that's the case, it may be better to, to look at that same difference equation and rewrite it and say it's y of n minus 2 r cos theta y of n minus 1 plus r squared y of n minus 2. And that's equal to x of n. And so the, in this case, the roots the roots of the system would be r times e to the j plus or minus theta. Right, so they, 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 and the way I can usually solve this is I look at the n minus 2 term and, and say that's r squared, so solve that for r first, and then set the coefficient of the n minus 1 term and set that equal to 2r cos theta. And since I already know r, I'm solving for cos theta to get sine theta. And so when I do that, well, uh, a couple things are happening here. One is, is my I, I should write out my frequency response now using the same process. And again, good opportunity if you want a little more practice. Pause the video here, find h of e to the j omega on your own, and then check your answer against mine if, if you want that extra practice. Right, so h of e to the j omega, assuming you're, you're back from pausing and, and, and testing your Fourier transform muscles a little bit, it'll be 1 divided by 1 minus 2r cos theta e to the minus j omega, and then uh, plus r squared e to the minus j 2 omega. And uh, I can use uh, these forms and go back to do partial fractions and a lot of complex algebra that I am not going to torment you with today. Uh, it just seems unkind. Uh, if you want to see all the steps, you can in the book or work them out on your own. But when you go through all this, you're going to end up with uh, r of n times sine of n plus 1 theta over a constant that is sine of theta, all times u of n. And so the reason this is called underdamped is that this is a solution that is as at zero for negative time. This R of n is an envelope that dies off just like the first order system, but inside it we have this sine of n plus one theta going on, right? So this is changing its behavior depending on the value of theta. Theta is is the frequency that things are oscillating inside the envelope with. And so if I if I drew that out. I'm going to sort of draw it with an envelope that I'm working within and then show what's going on. So I might have something like this for r to the n. And I need to say this is minus r to the n. And then, so that's the, the envelope, but then the sign is changing signs within it. So at time 0, it starts off at 1. And when n is 0, this whole thing is equal to 1. But then after that, it's going, well, it may not be going quite that. So it may be oscillating more slowly based on the sine function. All right, so it's going to sort of be ringing up and down within here, which, which is what I get when I multiply the sine whose amplitude is changing. So this, the, you know, the frequency of this, what's going on inside, 
of the oscillations is based on theta, the R of n determines the envelope of how fast those oscillations are dying down. So if, R, if I make R smaller, these things would die down even faster, right? So it would sort of have the same, if it's got the same theta but a smaller R, this thing would die down even faster. If I made uh, R bigger, it would take longer to die out. Right, so I'd have the same frequency of what's going on in between, but the envelope would be slower to squeeze down. Similarly, if I keep R the same and change theta, we'll see things oscillate at different frequency. It'll oscillate faster or slower, but overall die down at the same rate based on R. Right, so maybe that, that's important enough that I'll write that on another slide before we wrap up here and go on. Uh, on to the next page. So one important point here is the closer R is to 1, the slower the envelope, the slower the oscillations decay away. And so again, the envelope is, is like the first order systems we've already seen. They're just di it's dying down, but what, what's going on is that's sort of a guide that the uh, that sine theta term is oscillating inside. But then the, the theta value determines the frequency of oscillations inside that envelope. So these are, like we saw in circuits, this is the discrete version of a resonant system. When we have the, the value of A1 and A2 chosen to give me these complex conjugates. So these determine the frequency of the oscillations inside the envelope. So I'm going to stop here and then uh, go on uh, to uh, in the next video, I'll show you, again, some MATLAB examples of implementing this in MATLAB to look at the different uh, frequency responses and how R and theta change uh, H of E to the J omega. All right, I'll see you in the next video.